Good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever it is. Uh, happy holidays. Hope everybody is well. Be well. Prosperous and healthy new year. Not legal advice. Like, subscribe, but do not rely. Comment. Show pets, animals, pets and animals and plants and anything else you want. Please share. Please comment. And if you have questions, please ask. And I will, I look at all comments and will if appropriate, we'll respond. So hope everybody is well. I'm going to talk a little bit about finger motion capybara and MMTLP after I discuss a couple of things. And I'm going to end with one of these things too. So what's the state known for selling small drinks? Of course, it's mini soda. And what do you call a group of men in line to get haircuts a barber queue and last but not least and you have to think about this one so think about this one and i'll do one more at the end of this video so you'll get one at the end but think about this and you'll understand it i hope what do you call a magician who loses his magic the answer is Ian. Think about it. Think about the word magician. And we'll do a uh, we'll do one on the way out. We'll do an outro joke on the way out. So I wanted to talk about two things. I was only going to talk about one, but something came up, so I wanted to address it. So capybara uh, finger motion. So capybara uh, did a shortened distort report. Mark Basile filed an action against capybara. Capybara didn't respond. He sought a default. He got a default, then he submitted the judgment. That judgment is currently before the court. I got a copy of it. This is directed at Capybara. So the default was against Capybara. I think there's other action that is pending, maybe against Benzinga or Mr. Benzinga, or and some other individual, maybe an Apple Boom, something like that, if that's a real person. And we'll see how that turns out. But what was interesting about this judgment, which I saw that was filed, was in addition to the relief that was requested against Capybara, and we'll see where that goes, there, there's relief requested against parties who might publish uh, the documents and information of Capybara. And I think that's the most important part. So if we could stop the publishers from publishing false material, that would uh, impact, of course, those short and distort reports. So I looked at the order and I found the order interesting because, and I'll, I'll kind of read it to you or summarize it. So in essence, he's asking for relief for the court against Capybara. And on top of that, he wants relief against parties who might publish it and those who published it to issue a direct retraction, to remove all references and permanently being enjoined and restrained from republishing any of that matter. So I find those would be good. And if the court grants that relief, I think that will be helpful because that can be used with regard to other false, short, and distort reports. And what I found more interesting on this, on I guess on page four of the proposed order, which is before the court, but hasn't been signed by the court as of yet, was that if there was a violation of the order, uh, including the publication of the report, that that be treated as direct contempt by the court. So in other words, if somebody, Mr. Benzinga, let's say, violated the court order, that in addition to other relief that Mr. Basile or whoever else could go into court, get a contempt order from the court, which could be jail time, a fine, or both, or neither, but often it's often it might be a warning, then jail time, and then more jail time for further contempt. So we'll see how that plays out. Of course, it has to be enforceable against a party that's in the United States, so we'll see that. But I think the order itself, especially if release, relief is granted against the publishers, will be really important because it can be used against other publishers publishing other short and distort false reports and will require 
I think, indirectly, the publishers to analyze what they're publishing. And I think no matter what, that's going to decrease the number of false short reports. So I'm pleased by where this is going. The fact that Capybara didn't respond is neither here nor there. I didn't expect them to respond because they're scumbags and they're just out and about, just trying to make trouble. And uh, I obviously will bring you up to date once the judgment is granted and to the extent there's any changes in this. But I found it interesting and I wanted to comment on that. So that, that's the comment. Secondarily, I wanted to comment about arbitration. So I'm in fidelity arbitration involving MMTLP. I discussed this before. I said I would kind of go through as the arbitration went out, I'd kind of bring people up to speed as to what was going on. So they would learn a little bit about arbitration to the extent that they participated in arbitration or future arbitration, then um, it would I thought it would be helpful. So um, with regard to the FINRA arbitration and my arbitration against uh, Fidelity, in choosing an arbiter, you're given three piles of names. Some are senior, some are less senior, some have more industry experience, some have less ind industry experience. The idea is to pick uh, the, the uh, panel out of those lists. And in my case, because of the amount in controversy, the panel number was three. So I was given a, a bunch of lists. And then I requested a disclosure be sent out to all these people regarding that they would be fair and open as to issue of naked shorting, then the concept of naked shorting, and they would not be biased. And uh, eventually FINRA agreed to do that. They sent it out to the entire list. I'd say half the people or more didn't respond. So when we got to choose arbiters, I it was my position those people hadn't qualified because they hadn't sent back the disclosure requirement. And I asserted that. And then you rank the remaining num members. So we ranked, I ranked whatever ones that were left. And it was a small number of the initial amount because most had been disqualified by me because they hadn't responded or there were other reasons. So eventually, and, and I give a ranking, the other side gives a ranking, it's given to FINRA. FINRA does some magic, uses some algorithm, and chooses a panel. Two of the original three people I had ranked were chosen. A third was chosen by FINRA. I don't know how. Um, I objected to the panel because I didn't think there were enough candidates, so it wasn't a fair and reasonable panel to select. The director denied my request. Thereafter, one the third uh, arbiter that was selected, not by me, had to be disqualified. So I another arbiter in this insufficient number that were available on the panel was selected to fill that spot. So we had three. I objected again. Denied. We moved forward, filed a bunch of motions, including special discovery motions. The special discovery motions in FINRA require extraordinary circumstances. Because this was involved a U3 halt, because by definition, that's extraordinary circumstances, and those circumstances were found by FINRA. They're the ones who made the declaration and admission. Therefore, I asserted amongst other reasons, that establishes as a matter of law and fact that these were extraordinary circumstances which justify special discovery, including depositions. Part, some of the depositions included Sam Draddy, Patricia Casamates, people from FINRA who were involved in early December, were involved with regard to knowledge of fraud, blue sheeting, etc. One was an author who's from Forbes, uh, forgot his name, Brandon K, I believe is his name. Um, and his article, which defamed us, was attached to the answer filed by Fidelity. Uh, so they made it a part of the answer. So I wanted to take his deposition because they relied upon that. And there were a bunch of other people that I requested depositions of. I used the extraordinary circumstances of the U3 halt, and all these witnesses were involved or had knowledge either as to the U3 halt or my account. And um, that was the subject of the motion. And I used the U3 halt as justification along with the relevance of the testimony. The uh, group of 
arbiters, and I'm using that term gen generously, ruled, denied all those requests, and they gave no reason for their denial. So they said no, without any rationale, and without any hearings. So as complicated and confusing as this matter was, and as deficient as I thought the panel was, not only did they not have a hearing, but they gave no reasoning for their denial. So as a result of that, I filed a new motion to get rid of this panel because I, my assertion is there's no way possible they could have understood what they were ruling upon. I attached a copy of the, of the Norman letter and the 74 signatures. I indicated that uh, they just weren't they couldn't have ruled on the matter they knew about because they never had experienced a U3 halt. I indicated they violated their oath, which requires them to not prejudge, to not bias, and to conduct a fair proceeding. And that was filed, filed um, about two weeks ago. An opposition was filed by my opposing counsel representing the scumbags of fidelity. And he basically asserted that my, my up upset was based upon the denial of the motions. I filed a response to that yesterday, the day before, I think it's two, day, two days ago, asserting that it was the incompetence of the panel, their failure to even conduct a hearing in light of Congress's assertion of the complexity of this matter, and their failure to issue any rationale which established as a matter of fact and law that they weren't doing their job and they were violating their oath, amongst other things, was not happy with the panel. And then yesterday, on top of that, because there is a FINRA rule, so as I indicated early on, I challenged the validity of the panel because of the number of people, and that, that objection was directed at the director. And after I filed my motion to get rid of the panel directly with the panel, yesterday I filed another motion with the director, a motion for reconsideration of his prior denial because there's new facts, the new facts being how they went about deciding these special motions for discovery, et cetera. And I also, so those are new facts and if in a motion for reconsideration, as long as you have new facts, you can assert that for the decision maker to reconsider. On top of that, there's another provision of the rules that permit you, permit the director to get rid of the panel if they fail to disclose material matter in their disclosure documents. And as to that, my assertion is these guys asserted in their oath that they would do a fair job and work at making a determination as to this arbitration. And obviously in their own work product, we could see that they are not living that up, up to it. Either they don't understand, they don't care, they have a bias that they want to uh, carry out or some other reason, but all in violation of their oath. And that was not disclosed. And so that's now with the director, um, I will expect some type of response from the panel, and I will expect, expect some type of response from the director. I also will be serving a report on the federal court that sent us to arbitration to keep them apprised of what's going on. And I'm making a full record so the extent these jokers continue on with this nonsense, which I will fight them the entire way, obviously, um, it will be documented and the federal court that ultimately will have a chance to confirm or vacate the award will be fully apprised of what's going on. So that's kind of the, the setup. That's where we are in the arbitration. Uh, obviously, it's super contentious. Uh, we haven't got to... Oh, oh I, I guess I should add this. So I just, this is on top of that. So after the the arbiters issued their ruling with regard to special discovery. Prior to that, I had submitted written discovery. After the ruling of the arbiters saying, you know, denying everything, 
Fidelity's counsel provided purported responses to the written discovery, and their purported responses were all objections. So they took the bias, prejudice of the panel, relied upon that by not acting in good faith with regard to discovery. So they used the panel further and their inaction to be to act in bad faith. So that's just on top of that. That was also pointed out in my work product to the director and will be pointed out to the federal court. I will keep you apprised, of course, but I wanted to give you an insight as to how the process goes. So selection of arbiters, then there's an oath that's given, and then you can file objections. The director has the right to remove the panel and the panel itself can remove themselves and we're letting the federal court know too. And last but not least, as I promised, um, I gave up my seat to an elderly, elderly person on the bus and that is how I lost my job as a bus driver. Anyway, hope everybody's well. Any questions, concerns, comments, please put them. Hope that brought you a little up to speed as to what's going on in my arbitration. Hope it brought you up to speed of what's going on with Cappy Baron Finger Motion. We'll talk later. Be well. Happy holidays. Take care. And.